this evening we've been in church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Bible study. Our scripture will come from Psalm 34, verses 1, 2, 3, and verse number 8. Psalm 34, verses 1, 2, and 3, and we'll conclude with verse 8. And it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And our song for tonight is, I Give You Praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. Oh, my Lord. I give you praise. With all my heart. With all my soul. We honor you tonight, Father God, for you are worthy yes. of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Yes. God, we thank you, Father God, for the way you do things. Even when we don't understand, Father God, you are God and you are the sovereign one. Even when we would have things done a different way, Father God, you know what is best for us. Now, Lord, we come to the house of prayer. We ask you to honor our prayer. We come to the house of prayer asking you, Father God, to bless us with a right relationship, an intimate relationship and fellowship with you. Lord, we come to this house of prayer, Father God, 
asking you to speak to us now by way of your word. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. So in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus the Christ, your son we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank you. Yes, Lord. Oh, my Lord. Yes, Lord. I give you praise. Amen. He is worthy of all the praise. He is the worthy God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. In our Experience in God book, we're on page 44. Page 44 is where we are tonight. We were talking last week about knowing God's voice, hearing his voice, reacting to his voice, knowing God's voice. So if we're going to, to know God's voice, then we need a relationship with him that is intimate. If you pull it all the way down on the left side, all the way down the right side, I'm sorry, those two flats on the right side, that'll kill some of it. Amen. We need to know God's voice. We need to hear God's voice. And we need to be obedient to God's voice. Henry Blackaby in the book entitled Experiencing God Tonight deals with the fact that when we know God's voice, then we can react the right way. Yes? And when we react the right way, that's called obedience. So what we must be obedient to the voice of the Almighty God. We must be obedient. Obedient. We're in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 39. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 and 39. And then Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 and 39. And Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. Sister Brown is going to read them for us. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 and 39. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Amen. Then Luke 19, verses 41 through 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Amen. We're talking about relationship, intimate relationship. Jesus says a evil and adulterous people look for a sign. Isn't that something? We always want a sign. But you know, if God always gives us a sign, and yes, sometimes he gives us a sign, but if God always gave us a sign, then there would not be any need for faith. Because as we walk in faith, we're walking in a spirit of not knowing where we're going. Abraham left his folk, left his place of worship, left his gods left his home and stepped out on faith. Yeah. 
So Abraham becomes the father of faith because he walks out on faith. He set a godly example before us. You see, before Jesus showed up in the New Testament, the only thing they had to go on was God's word, God speaking to them and them following through. What the prophets said, what, what God said, they follow it. Remember Hebrews says to us, Hebrews chapter 1 says, in times past, King James called it in sundress times. In times past, God spoke to us in the past. God spoke to us directly. He spoke to us through the prophets directly. But now he speaks by way of his son. And we discovered as we passed through the book earlier that he speaks by way of his son. He speaks by way of the Bible. He speaks by way of our circumstances. He speaks by way of the Holy Spirit. And as God speaks to us by way of the Holy Spirit, everything that the Holy Spirit says is what Jesus has said. Everything that the Holy Spirit says, you can find it in God's Word. But we're going to find out tonight that when the Holy Spirit shows you something and God's Word says something, we're going to find out that you got to make sure it's for you. Amen. How many of you seen people standing next to a burning bush watching the bush burn and the bush never was consumed? Anybody ever thought that? Yes. All these wildfires in California and in Texas is consuming houses, fields, vegetation, people. But in Moses' conversation to God, this bush was burning and was never consumed. Even though we read it in the Word, we have not seen that since. So we know that God can speak to us other than through the burning bush. Even though it's in the word, God has not spoken to me, I don't know about you, by way of a burning bush. Yes? No? Burning bush? Are there any burning bush hearers in here today? <laughs> so we know that God spoke to Moses by way of a burning bush, but even through the word of God, God is speaking. And while he is speaking, we all have come to the conclusion that he has spoken to us other than through the body bush. Yes? yes? So he speaks to us by way of our relationship. Brother Miles. The relationship is the key to knowing God's voice, to hearing when God speaks. The correct answer is B. What about A, C, and D? Sometimes in scripture, God gave a miraculous sign to assure the person that the word was from him. Gideon is an example. See Judges 6. However, asking God for a sign often indicates unbelief. When the scribes and the Pharisees asked Jesus for a miraculous sign, Jesus condemned them as an evil and adulterous generation. Matthew 12, 38 through 39. They were so self-centered and sinful, they could not recognize when God was in their midst. See Luke 19, 41 through 44. Are we able to recognize when God is in our midst? Are we able to recognize when God is in our midst? You know when we say that God is in our midst, when the church catches on fire for the Lord. He's here, he's here. When shouting is going on throughout the room. God is here, God is here. My question is, was he here before people start shouting? Was he here? Was he here in your circumstances that you did not like? Was he present when you got laid off? Was he present when your loved one passed away? Was he present when something unfortunately happened? He's still here. He's still here. 
when we go to the doctor and we got a good report, you know what we always say? God is good. But I double dare you to say God is good when you got a bad report. Mm -hmm. We can express our faith real well when God does it for us. Mm -hmm. And people around us say, whoa, they have connection with God. Mm -hmm. That person can pray and God will answer. But what about when you pray and God doesn't answer your way? One lady had, had canceled several times, and after she moved on to another church, she came back to the New Beginning Church and said, this is the church that prayed me through before, so I left my church, I and mean, I'm paraphrasing, I left my church this morning, and I came back to the New Beginning Church for you all to pray for me as you have prayed before. And to this day, she no longer lives. Is God still good? Mm -hmm, still good? Because he didn't do what we asked him to do. Did he stop being good? No. <laughs> but when we have a relationship with God, an intimate relationship, which is nothing more than fellowship, when we have an intimate relationship with God, we ought to be able to come to the conclusion that God is good even if he didn't do what I wanted him to do. That's right. That's right. We can't use prayer as a fire escape. We can't use God as a bellhop. Hmm. We can't tell God, go fetch this and bring it back to me. You know, one of the worst prayers I've ever heard comes from the local church when we pray, God, go to the hospital. God, go to the prison. God, go to the homeless. Well, God told you to go. <laughs> he says, what you have done to the least of these You've also done to me. Did you feed the hungry? Did you shelter the homeless? What you've done to the least of these, you've done also to me. So the relationship that we have is the key to knowing who God is. And it's also the key to knowing if it's God's voice or not. We got to stop being so concerned, and we ought to be concerned about what God is doing, but we have to be more concerned about knowing God than seeing what God is doing in our lives. That's why we praise him, we worship him, even if nothing happened that we, we want to happen. Even in turmoil, I don't know if Brother Miles remember, but there was a young lady who had, who had just gotten married and she was expecting a baby and she went to the doctor and the doctor said, the baby is no more. That lady came to Sunday school class and she was a young woman. We were in our 20s. She came to Sunday school class that Sunday morning and she was waving her hand and thanking God, saying, God, thank you that you're more important, more intelligent than I am. God, thank you that you saw fit to, to refrain me from having this baby because you could, and I hear her words today, you could see 18 years down the road, and I can't. Now that's praising. That's praising even when you're going through. And it's turmoil when you go through it. It's painstaking. It's agonizing. But she came, to, she came to that Sunday school class that day and she said, Lord, I thank you that you didn't let me get further down the road. Wow. That's amazing. I learned a lesson in that Sunday school class that day. Brother Miles didn't teach me that lesson. <laughs> JC taught me. She, she taught me that day. That you got to praise him when you get laid off. You got to praise him when lights are out. You have to praise him because you have the right relationship with him. You have an intimate relationship with him. So much so until you're willing to praise him regardless of what happens. Job was that way. Job, Job 
Job met with the Lord, prayed unto the Lord, because he said, some of my ten children may have sinned today. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of him having a praying spirit, in the midst of him having a lifestyle of prayer, children get killed. Mm -hmm. Livestock dies. Yes. Wife goes crazy. <laughs> Boys on his body. Mm -hmm. Sickness sneaks up on him. And in the midst of it, he says, though he slays me, yet will I trust. Got to believe God. Got to believe that God has the best answer, even when we want him to do something different. The relationship is the key to knowing God's voice and hearing when God speaks. We always want to hear when God speaks. Let me tell you, I've heard God speak loudly and clearly on my way to mess up. Turn around. Don't go another further. Don't do it. I'm warning you. I'm telling you, you're going to get in trouble with them and you're going to get in trouble with me. God speaks so clearly when you are in right relationship. I've been there. Anybody else been there where I don't wake up? What, have you been there where you had a routine every morning of meeting God and that morning you choose to do something else? You choose to look at something else? You choose to go ahead with your day without spending quality time with him? And then you're like dragging God out the door. God, I didn't spend time this morning, but you need to come on go with me. Bless me with traveling grace when you didn't spend time with me. But when you have an intimate relationship with God and you don't spend quality time with him, guess what happened? You feel it. You, you see it. And the Holy Spirit is still ringing your bell saying, wait a minute, here I am. Here I am. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You forgot. You forgot Psalm 91 this morning. My, my thing is Psalm 91. Every morning, Psalm 91. I mean, when I spend my quality time with God doing my same custom, and if it's not Psalm 91, it's time in prayer, meditation, time along with God. When I don't do it, guess what happens? My day is thrown off. Then I get to the appointment where I've been rushing to, and ain't nobody there the whole time but me. <laughs> what God is saying to me is that you should have spent quality time with me. Now I got to try to spend that time sitting in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. When all we have to do is just spend quality time with God. Have you ever rushed out the door without spending time with God and the train comes and just sit on the track? Mm -hmm. I mean, out of all the days, you're going to sit on this track in front of me and I, I left early today. Have you ever got a brand new job in the first day? I mean, I mean, this is a disaster. Your first day at work, you're late. You don't even know where the back door in, in is in order to sneak through it. And then when you put your card in, they know what time you came in, know how late you were, and all they got to do is look at it. But when you spend quality time with God, you create an intimate, ongoing relationship with him where you can hear his voice. Where you can know his voice. The devil has told me some things that sound good, make sense. But I could tell that wasn't God. But when I am not spending quality time with him and I don't have an intimate relationship with him, I will do what makes sense. But you know God does stuff that doesn't make sense. Does it make sense for, for God to get Moses' attention by a bush? Bush has nothing to do with his leadership, has nothing to do with the fact that he killed somebody, has nothing to do with the fact that he's on the run. God gets his attention through a burning bush. Does that really make sense to you? But God majors in stuff that doesn't make sense. The first shall be last. That doesn't make sense to me. The last shall be first. That doesn't make sense. The rewards of the righteous are laid up 
with the unrighteous, and the unrighteous is going to have to get it up one day. It doesn't make sense to me. God gives us favor when we did not do what the steps told us to do, and that's the next paragraph. God gives us favor when we're not in order. When you look at Mark chapter 5, this woman is bleeding. She is hemorrhaging for 12 years, and all the customs around her, she broke up. Every last one of them says to us, God does not make religious sense. And because he doesn't make religious sense, we cannot get stuck in tradition thinking God is going to answer like this. Asking God for a sign, according to Matthew 12 and Luke 19, asking God for a sign is a sign or an indication of unbelief. And we all want a sign, don't we? We all want a sign from God. But when we believe God, we're going to trust him to the end. Asking for a sign. Asking for a sign indicates unbelief. When the scribes and the Pharisees asked Jesus for a miraculous sign, Jesus condemned them and called them evil and adulterous nation. An evil and adulterous people. Even an evil and adulterous generation. Why are you looking for a sign? Just trust me. Walk with me. Create a fellowship, Kononia. Create Kononia intimately involved with me. Create a Kononia, Kononia with me. And when you do that, you will hear my voice and you will know my voice. He says, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. Then he talks about the fact that it is self-centeredness and it is sinfulness. All in the middle of our stuff, guess what happens? God speaks. Can we hear him? Will we listen to him? And how does he speak? Just the words. A formula is not the way to recognize God's voice either. How many other burning bushes did God use besides the one with Moses? None. God does not want us to become an expert at using a formula. If there is a formula to, he to hearing from God, you would not have to seek God with all your heart. You could mindlessly use the formula and neglect your relationship with God. He, want, he wants an intimate love relationship with you. He insists that you depend on him alone. Hearing God does not depend on a method or a formula, but on a relationship. Thank you. So when you look at this, God is looking forward to an intimate relationship with you. Come near. He is looking forward to you intertwining your will into his will. He's looking forward to you being blessed by him through the relationship you have with him. As quiet as it's kept, my relationship with my parents is a blessing. As quiet as it's kept, even at age 61, my relationship with my parents and my obedience to them gets me blessed. First promise in Exodus 20, in the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and mother that thy days shall be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor thy father and mother. How many more children will we have still living if they just honored father and mother? Let me tell you what I didn't say. I didn't say Every person that's dead at a young age was because they didn't honor their father and mother. But there's a great benefit 
to me respecting those who have ruled over me. Amen. To honor them. There are great benefits to me honoring my pastor. Great benefits. There are great benefits to me supporting my supervisor. Benefits. Because I'm not really honoring the man that keeps doing crazy things to me or the woman who just keeps de denying me that pr promotion. I'm honoring the office. I'm honoring the position. Because whatever you do with them, somebody's going to do with you. Whatever comes around, goes around. However you treat authority, sooner or later, whoever you have authority over is going to mistreat you ten times as well. I'm looking and searching in the back of my mind right now. What did I do wrong to some of my pastors to deserve this? I mean, I'm searching, I'm looking, I'm looking for the time that, that I did not obey, I did not, uh, did not support. I'm looking for the time that I was insubordinate to deserve this. What did I do? What did I say? How did I react to those who have leadership over me? And then those that I have leadership over. How am I treating them? Am I just pushing them around because I have leadership over them? Or am I sensitive to their needs? Am I one who hear them? Am I one who boss them around? Or do I have compassion? If you're going to recognize God's voice, you can't do it through a formula. X plus Y squared equals to Y minus 2. You're going to get that. You get the same answer every time if you get the problem right. If you get the problem right, you're going to get the same answer every time. What the Bible is saying that you can't treat God like that. It's not found in a formula. It's not five steps to life. It's not 13 steps to satisfaction. It's not nine steps to a better marriage. But when you have an intimate relationship with God, you know how to treat your spouse mm -hmm. and you know how to treat your friends. People don't have to tell you, treat your friends right, treat your friends right, treat your friends right. But when we spend quality time along with God, creating a relationship with him, we don't have to look for a burning bush. When we spend time in God's word, in prayer, in meditation, that's how we get to know him. In the book, Sharing the Gospel, Good News on the Go, the author, the, the, the visionary author talks about the fact that you ought to spend 90% of your time in preparation and then 10% of your time in actually sharing the gospel. You ought to spend 90% of your time along with God compared to the 10% of your time actually sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. It is about quality time and intimately involved in a love relationship with God. God insists that you depend on him and him alone. God is insisting that we do not depend on our resources, but depend on him as our source. What's the difference between resource and source? What's the difference? Give me a, give me a name of a resource. Give me a title of a resource. Give me an example of a resource. What's a resource? How did you get over here tonight? How did you get over here? Vehicle. Vehicle. That's a resource. How did you pay your bills? Cash out. Money. <laughs> cash out. That's, a re that's certainly a resource. And it runs out. <laughs> and that's a good example. When you have a resource... The resource does crazy things. 
How many of you have uh, a phone? How many of you have a flip phone? Nobody? No one has a flip phone? What's going on here? Is it the clock? You didn't turn it back in? Why don't you all have flip phones now? Why, why don't we have flip phones? They outdated. It's a new thing now. Yeah, that's they outdated? No. Some of them are outdated. Coming out with the new flip, the, the modern flip phone. Oh, they got a modern flip phone, but it's a smartphone now. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about resources. Let me tell you about resources. When you have a smartphone, your smartphone will do dumb things. Oh, yeah. You're right. Anybody in this house? Your smartphone will do dumb things because it is a resource. And resources shut down. The flip phone was the greatest gadget since all time. When the phone first came out, I had what they call a brick phone. I was the only one of my friends walk around with a brick phone. That thing will tw weigh 12 pounds. We went on a mission trip. It was bigger than the mission trip phone that everybody shared. It was twice the size of a brick phone. And we all had to share that phone because it was the only phone that would call back to the United States from Czech Republic. The only phone that would call back to the United States from, from uh, Brazil. And we took turns. And the window of opportunity was very short because when we were asleep, you were awake. And even on that phone, we had to find somewhere to get up on the line because the phone was shut down if you weren't standing. If you moved two inches to the right, the phone shut down. Your mama back home thinks something's wrong because it is a resource. And we think since we got smartphones, this is our source. If you don't believe me, ask the teenager. This is the main thing. We, we, if we treated our Bibles the way we treat our phones, mm -hmm. we would be much better off. How many times you went back home and got your phone? <laughs> How many times you were late for your meeting because you had to go back home and get your phone? <laughs> you couldn't even imagine eight hours without your phone. That's right. Why can we go eight hours without even thinking about Scripture? How can we go eight hours with even, without even talking to the Lord? How can we go eight hours without even meditating on the word of God when we put our phones before God? I hear you, I hear you, the critics are saying, they're saying, but my Bible is on my phone. How many times do you open that app <laughs> compared to other apps? I remember when we, we, were, we were in this building and, and uh, the choir was in rehearsal and the drama was always on his phone. I mean, he was always on his phone. He was always on his phone. And, and, and he's always on his phone. So one day he decided he was going to walk out of choir rehearsal. Because his phone was more important than choir rehearsal. About three weeks later, he come to the office and asked me for his job back. Did y'all get that? <laughs> About three weeks later, he comes, I need my job back. No, you don't. You walked off your job mm. for the sake of your phone. These are resources. God is our source. And our source never, ever, ever runs out. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. You know, we have more folk in church sleeping in slumber than, than, than in the courthouse. In the courthouse, the bailiff, the bailiff walk up and said, put that phone up, we put it up. Mm -hmm. The bailiff says, all right, we stand up. Mm -hmm. But if the preacher say, stand for the scripture, why well, well, ain't got to do what he says. Mm -hmm. We would stand for a man a judge, but we won't stand in honor of God in the greatest judge of all time. Isn't that something? So when we have the right connection with God, we don't have to worry about a formula. The, the, the successful position with God is to totally depend on him. Not on a method, 
and not on a form. It is all about a relationship. It is all about a relationship. How many of you all have certain days you do certain things at your house? On Tuesday, I wash. <laughs> on Wednesday, I clean the restrooms. On Wednesday, I work late, so I walk in Bible study late. <laughs> yes? <laughs> on Sundays, I volunteer for overtime. Because I don't want to be there anyway. And I know if I tell pastor that I had to work, you know, I, he'll understand that. No, I don't understand. Anybody that works seven days a week needs to take some time off for the Lord. Anybody who worked two, three jobs, they need to cut them loose. Pastor Rose says it like this. He says two jobs are for two people. That's why we're pushing and convincing our young people to go to school. Get your education. Graduate. Don't quit your way. Go ahead and get your education so at least you can make some decisions on your own. Because without an education, other folk in other situations make decisions for you. Get all you can while you're young. Get everything you can get. Fill your head and your heart now because when you get old, it's not going to come to you like that anymore. Any witnesses in there? Anybody just want to? It's not going to come to you like that anymore. So, and then when you're young, don't spend all your time in foolishness. Spend your time with the Lord. You have to be willing to do today what others won't do in order to have tomorrow what others won't have. You have to be willing to do today. And it's not age related. You have to be willing to do today what others will not do in order to have tomorrow what others will not have. And one of those things is common sense. In the country we call it mother wit. Just common sense. I mean, some children, some adults do some of the things that even they step back and say, why did I do that? It's just common sense. There are church folks still trying to figure out why they haven't come back to church. And it has nothing to do with listening online. It has nothing to do with with uh, whether or not I can get the same word online. Because Jesus says that you have to be in the center. Yeah, we were out for a year or so, but the fact is, we had a reason to be out. And people who were out were calling me. Brother Whitlock, they were calling me. I've been out, we've been out too long. We gotta do something. This, this, this Zoom is not doing it. The same people that were calling me are the same people that's after today. After last Wednesday. After last Sunday. After the Sunday before last. We had a funeral here. And, uh, you know, when we have a funeral, I'm very kind. And I, you know, I write these resolutions and, and bless people. And one lady said, oh, pastor, when you open back up the church, we're going to be there every Sunday. You know that feeling when people get so emotional. <laughs> they get so emotional. Oh, Pastor, we're going to be here when you own the church back up. Now, this is August. I said, sister, we've been back in church since April. <laughs> so it tells me you're not watching online. It tells me that you haven't come back because you didn't come back, didn't want to come back. And also tell me, you still not back today. Mm -hmm. I think we need to go back to how they used to do it in the country. You need a letter from your pastor before you get out of church. <laughs> you need a letter from your pastor before you join another church. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to leave, you leave the right way, right? Because when you have a relationship with somebody, and when you are in communion with somebody, even the body of Christ 
You are in communion with them. You are tied in this relationship with them. You shouldn't be ghosting the church. There are so many people ghosting the church. <laughs> and the thing about it is, if your pastor's not right, get you another pastor. The problem is, you leave this pastor because you say he's wrong, and now you're blaming the next pastor. It tells me you do not have an intimate relationship with God. And don't mention tithing. I'm not going to tithe because this pastor says so. But that tells me you don't have a problem with the pastor. You got a problem with God. So you might as well tell God, look God dead in the face. Look God dead in the eyes and say, God, I ain't doing it. Because I got a problem with you, God. Don't blame it on the pastor. Don't blame it on the people. Don't blame it on the building. Look God in the face. Somebody said the other day that those who, who support certain candidates, why don't you just come out and say that you live by the same hate that he lives by? Don't talk about the economy. Don't talk about jobs because all those things are good now. So those things are not the reason. It's because you want to hate just like the candidate hates. But when you have a right relationship with God, you don't marry, you don't marry a terror truth. Okay, Sister Barney, I'm, I'm going to let that one go. Relationship with God. Some may wonder why answer B is not acceptable. They may ask, can't I get a word from the Bible? Yes, you can. But only the Holy Spirit can reveal to you which truth of Scripture is a word from God for a particular circumstance in your life. The Holy Spirit must help you understand how a particular verse specifically applies to you. Even if the biblical circumstance is similar to yours, only God can reveal his word for your circumstance. Thank you. Right. So look at look at what he's saying. When we look at scripture, and we ought to look at scripture for a word from the Lord, but only the Holy Spirit can let us know when that particular word is just for us. The Bible says that Paul was picking up wood for a fireplace. A snake bit him. And he shook it off and went on to the next place to minister. Now, how many of y'all want to get bit by a snake? Don't you want to prove your relationship with God? Don't you want to prove that you have the power that's, that, that Paul had? No, no, so. No, so. No, so. No, so. He doesn't want to do it. Not so. So it's with us. That's a little, little snake. Uh, you already know the answer. <laughs> you already got the answer. <laughs> What's the answer? No, thank you. Don't you have the power? Aren't you walking with God? The Bible says you will drink poison and you will not die. Do you want some poison to put it to the test? Jim Jones got a whole slew of people killed by drinking poison. That's where we get the phrase, they drunk, they have drank the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. They drank the Kool-Aid and now they are dead. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Because they drank the Kool-Aid. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit has to reveal to you, even though you're reading the scripture, the Holy Spirit reveals to you whether it's for you or not. The example I gave last week. The Bible said, God said, I'm going to open my Bible. Wherever the Bible opens up, that's what I'm going to do. The Bible says, and Judas went out and hung himself. Right quickly, he understood, this is not for me. Let me find another verse. So we have to understand, the Holy Spirit reveals to us what is for us. How many of you heard the statement, living like the Joneses? Everybody living like the Joneses. What does that mean? Living like the Joneses. So it's a bit What does it mean? Living like the Joneses. 
Okay. Living like, living like somebody else is living. I always wonder why I said Jones, but I guess that'll do. Mm -hmm. There was a song out, Me and Mrs. Jones. I don't think that had anything to do with it. <laughs> I just I just tried to test your Holy Ghost spirit. So everybody been listening to this song, huh? So when, when you living like the Joneses, they're saying that they get a new car, I'm gonna get one. They get a new house, I'm gonna get one. They they get a new baby, I'm gonna get one. And be before it's over, all of it is lost and the Jones is going on down the road. That's right. mm -hmm. We have to count the cost. Mm -hmm. You can drive anything you want to drive, live any way you want to live, but you better count the cost and don't get into it then and say, God, here I am again, God, get me out of here. If, if you already got a credit card maxed out, maxed out, guess what? Mm -hmm. You can't go on vacation this year. Mm -hmm. all right. If it's already maxed out, mm -hmm. there's no sense of you calling those people telling them to give you another card. Mm -hmm. If you pay the very minimum on your card, sure. Jesus will be back before you pay it off. <laughs> I guarantee you, mm -hmm. if you pay $25 on a $25,000 card, and they purposely ask you for $25. Yep. I'm going to tell you something. The interest is greater mm -hmm. than the monthly payment. You will hear the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> and those of us who remain will be caught up in midair before you pay it off. Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, I don't have to worry about it then. But God holds us to be faithful as good stuff. So we have to understand that every word is not for you. That's why people, Pat Coliseum said, oh, he's coming to town with a rainbow word. He's walking the floor like never before. And their pastor been laboring and preaching to them 20, 30, 50 years, and now some guy come to town, take all their money, and he's gone, and they believe what he said. People who won't give tithes and offering to their local church that is struggling will ship money overseas or they will ship money to the next state because this guy is on TV. Mm -hmm. yep. Now he's on the internet. And he has so many, so many likes, so many followers. Oftentimes I get asked about Houston area pastors. What you think about him? What you think about them? What you think about them? I said, well, if you're into one-liners, if that's what you want, go on over there. One-liners, one line. They give you one-liner, and you say, oh, that's good, and that's all you got all day. <laughs> that tells me you don't have an intimate relationship with God. You are looking for a formula, and it's just not there. Sister Davis. Deuteronomy, um, 18 verses 20 through 22. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other small GODs, gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Amen. And in the book on page number 44, it says, you also need to be careful about claiming you have a word from God. Claiming to have a word from God is a serious matter. If God has spoken to you, you must continue responding to the word until it comes to pass, even for 25 years like Abram. If you have not been given a word from God, but say you have, you stand in judgment as a false prophet. You may say to yourself, 
How can we recognize a message? How can we recognize a message the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the Lord's name and the message has not come true or is not fulfilled, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Deuteronomy 18, 21 through 22. In the Old Testament, the penalty for being a false prophet is death. Deuteronomy 18, 20. That certainly is a serious charge. Do not take a word from God lightly. God loves you. He wants to have a close personal relationship with you. He wants you to depend on him when you seek a word from him. He wants you to learn to hear his voice and to know his will. Your relationship with him is the key to hearing when God speaks. Tell us about false prophets. You know he, and now prophetess, he or she are false prophets when they prophesy and it does not come true. You can even go further than that. You know he or she is a false prophet or prophetess when they label themselves as a prophet. Questions or comments? Somebody ought to say something right there. Somebody. Anybody? Maybe somebody over here ought to say something. How do you know that? How do I know which? Well, as the scripture says, a prophet that prophesies, it will come true, and they will continue to make that prophecy clear, even if it takes 25 years. But you know, the, the thing about, let's, let's not even get into dispensation, let's not even get into whether the prophet exists right now, okay? The when guys prophesy now, they prophesy around 24 hours. Oh, by in the morning, you're going to be blessed. Oh, by in the morning, the children will be straight. And what they do is they make it sound so good until you will drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> now, come on, tell the truth. Now, how many of y'all got in line, got your hand laid on you to receive the Holy Spirit? To receive the Holy Spirit. What happens when you're saved? The Holy Spirit comes in. That's why the songwriter says he walks with me, he talks with me, he tells me he's, he is, I am his own, right? When you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in when Jesus comes in. And the Holy Spirit is intelligent. And I don't need a prophet to tell me how intelligent the Holy Spirit is not. I guess y'all kind of feel like I don't deal with prophets. <laughs> is that what y'all feeling right now? <laughs> y'all right. <laughs> because this is the fact. If I work, I can buy stuff. If I steal, sooner or later we'll get caught. If I prophesy, lie, sooner or later somebody's going to bust me. Have you heard of the leap of faith? The leap of faith? The leap of faith? That movie, I think it was Martin. What's his first name? Martin. He went around from city to city, and he was doing miracles, supposedly. He was prophesying. And then one day, he came up to a boy in a wheelchair, and because his earbud went out, the lady couldn't tell him what row, couldn't tell him what seat. And the boy turned to Jesus, and he got healed by Jesus. And, and as he was getting run out of town, he was leaving town, and when he was leaving town, he had told the people it was gonna rain, and it had rained. 
And as he was leaving town, it started to rain. False prophets will always prophesy things that are not true and will not come to pass. Not only that, there is no need for prophets today. Who has Hebrews chapter 1? Hebrews chapter 1. We read that scripture two weeks ago. Hebrews chapter 1. Remember, we're talking about having an intimate relationship with God, right? We're not talking about the man of God or the woman of God having an intimate relationship with God so we can learn what God says. We want an intimate relationship with God so that we will be able to obey him. Who has it? Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Sister Brown. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1 and 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So when you look at that verse, it says, in sundry times. In times past. And when he says in times past, it's not today. Mm -hmm. In Sunday's time, in past, times past, God spoke to us by way of the prophets. I spoke to them by way of the prophets. But verse 2 says, now he is speaking by way of his son. So verse 2 says, He's speaking by way of son, his son, so that's how he is speaking. Verse 1 says, in Sundra's time, in times past, and someone read through another version, so it says in times past, he spoke by way of the prophets. So if he spoke by way of the prophets in times past, and he doesn't say that he's speaking by way of the prophets now, that says to us that there's no more need for prophets. Yes? And whatever we believe, we got to believe it and, and let the word supply us with it. So in times past, God spoke by way of the prophet. And God had no problem with uncturing the prophets. But now he speaks by way of his son. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He speaks by way of his son. Who has another version? Read verses 1 and 2 right quick for me, right quick. Verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Are you there? Yes. Yeah, go. Yeah. New King James. God, who at various times and in various ways, spoke in times past to the fathers of the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Okay, so, so Jesus is speaking to us. In the past, in Sunday's time, in times past, he spoke by way of the prophets. And since he spoke by way of the prophets in times past, God wants an intimate relationship with us so he can speak to us by way of his son, by way of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He says, speaking falsely as a prophet in the Old Testament meant death. Now we got guys and girls speaking anything because they hadn't died. They hadn't seen anybody die. But it is just as serious today to lie on God. The author says, be careful how you say, I got a word from the Lord. I have a rainbow word. I have a word that nobody else has. Let me tell you. Every preacher ought to have the same word. Every teacher ought to have the same word. 
It's not a new word. God is not, God is not writing it over. It's in his word. It's through his son. That's why it's so important. It's so important when, when you teach or preach to present the gospel. Because it is the gospel that saved men lives. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who shapes us all over, who makes us anew, who makes us afresh. It is that same word. And for the preachers that I hang out with, every time I go to their church, whether I'm preaching or they're preaching or somebody else is preaching, Every single time they they make sure throughout their message they drop little nuggets about the Son of God. Whenever somebody is bragging on what they know, that's not of God. Whenever somebody is healing somebody and talking about how they did it, it's not of God. Whenever somebody casts a blessing upon you, and it's not of God. The Bible says if they were living in the Old Testament, they would drop dead. Mm. And check this out. The thing about the 20th century and the 21st century prophets that men call themselves prophets, they prophesy prosperity. The only problem is they're the only ones prospering. That's one of the problems. The other problem is that they don't ever prophesy doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. The prophets of the Old Testament, they walk up to you and say, say, you the man. Mm -hmm. They walk up to you and say, in the morning, your head shall be decapitated from your neck. Mm -hmm. The birds will eat your brains, mm -hmm. and the birds will eat up, make their nest in your neck. And guess what happened? By, by in the morning, while the dew is yet on the ground, mm -hmm. their heads are separated from their neck. Mm -hmm. They're impaled on a pole. And the birds are surrounding them, building their nests and eating up out of their neck. So if a prophet prophesies, he has to be of time's past. The apostle, apostles, he has to be at least 2,000 years old. <laughs> yes? No? Maybe so. Maybe so. Question or comments? We ain't going to call no preacher's name now. <laughs> uh, well, he used to blow on people. <laughs> he okay. used to blow on people and... Uh, I couldn't believe it was just fascinating how many people would be there to get blown on by this man. And to me, they, they never did have faith. Now, so Sister Brian, you didn't send him no money, did you? Oh, no. All right, just check. <laughs> check and see a new beginning tithe and offering went on over there. <laughs> just one time? <laughs> so... So we have to understand, most of the time, it's just simple stuff that makes sense. Yeah. It just has to make sense. And even when God is moving, God will give you indications if you are in his word. I bet you everybody in this room will unanimously say, I never would have drank that Kool-Aid. How many people would have drank Kool-Aid? <laughs> I bet you there's no one in this room who will say that I would have gone down in Waco and stayed in that compound. Mm -hmm. And I would have stayed in there until they burned it to the ground. Mm -hmm. Nobody would say it. But check this out. There are actually some people that got burned up in the compound. There are actually people who drank the Kool-Aid and died. Mm -hmm. For real. And they really believed it. Mm -hmm. But every time Jesus came along, he upset their economy. Mark chapter 5, man running crazy in the graveyard. The Bible says no one could chain him. No one could shackle him. He broke the chain. 
Jesus comes in in verse number six. The Bible says he ran and bowed down and worshiped him. And then the people, when he pulled the demon, he 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 dicted the demons out. The people got upset. They got upset because Jesus had messed up their swine. He had taken their money. About 2,000 pigs. I don't care what the economy looked like. That was a lot of money. Then. That's a lot of money today. Jesus has our attention. He's trying to get our attention. And Jesus is the one who speaks through the word speaks to us. And that's why if you if you really want to get a, a loving relationship with God, read the book of Colossians. It talks about how Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. When you see Jesus, you see God. When Jesus speaks, you understand that Jesus is our leader, teacher, comforter, and our God. The Holy Spirit is with us. And that's why Jesus was able to die for us. Because he's the only perfect being. The only perfect man. The only innocent man. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how long you've been in church. There is none like Jesus. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only one of a kind son, his only unique son. God gave Jesus. Jesus gave his life on Calvary. He died for us. He was buried in a bar tomb. And early that third day, he rose from the dead. And that's how we're saved. If you have not received Jesus as your Savior, this is your this is an opportunity to get to know God in an intimate way. We have to get to know him through his son. The Bible says in Hebrews 1 and 2 that, that he's speaking to us by way of his son. His son is Jesus. If you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity. If you can believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, even while we were yet in sin, even before we were born, Jesus died for us on Calvary. He made a way for us. He died on a cross. They took him off the cross, laid him in a barber tomb, and early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. If you can believe this story, you can be saved right here, right now. You can be saved from hell and be saved to heaven. You can be saved that you will have an intimate relationship with God. Without salvation, you cannot know him. If you would, bow your head with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus... I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank you. We believe that if you honestly pray this prayer, trusting that Jesus is the Son of God and our obedience unto God, He gave His life as a ransom for you and me. We believe that you are born again and you are going to heaven. If you would please continue to join us on Wednesday night for Bible study at 7:15 p.m. Central Time. Join us at 9 a.m. for Sunday school and 10:30 a.m for worship service every Sunday. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes offering. Let me try again. It is offering time. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes offering and sacrificial gift. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it to P.O. Box 503, 
Missouri City, Texas 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City 77459. If you want to join us in our giving through Zelle, you can do so by zelling your money to lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Let us stand and be dismissed. Please remember second Sunday, September, second Sunday, September, uh, we celebrate 20 years as pastor and people, amen? 20 years of pastor and people, and also remember our family and friends day, we will be welcoming Pastor Earl Reed of Indianola, Mississippi, Pastor Earl Reed and those from the Mississippi Delta at our 1030 service, we're asking each person to invite five people to come and bring them on in as you come to celebrate our family and friends day. Father God, we thank you now, Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for this, your word. We ask you to bless your word, that we will be convicted. Bless your word, that we will we be committed, Father God. Bless your word, Father God, that your word will make us different. And Lord, we ask you to bless us as we go. Bless our choirs that come for rehearsal. Bless them to sing unto you and unto your glory. Bless us as we are uh, dismissed from this place. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. God bless you. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, If, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, we'll, we'll draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and keep you as I pray.